Okay. Well, greetings and salutations. This is Dean Tenney, a.k.a. Series 7 Guru, coming to you from my studio, fabulous Las Vegas, uh, with a coaching call. Uh, we do a coaching call lottery every Tuesday night at the end of our uh, call, which is about 6 p.m. Austin's the winner. He's taking his 66. He's on the last leg of his testing journey. Woo! -hoo! Matriculating down the field into scoring position. And he wants to talk about cap M. In general, a lot of 66s freak out when they get the math. And, you know, I warned them not to go down any rabbit holes, Austin. And what I want you to do is just take a strategic pause. Now, I didn't ask Austin. We don't want his business out on the street, but I didn't ask what he's getting on practice tests. You don't need to tell us. However, I would like you to be operating from abundance. And abundance means like I had a guy today told me he's getting 85%. That's fantastic. Because you're operating from abundance and you get some analytical method question, you know, future value, net present value, you know, uh, future value, any of that kind of stuff, what we're looking at here. It would be nice to be in a position to guess B and assign it to the universe. I'm not suggesting you should do that willy-nilly. But the purpose of Cap M is to decide if we're being properly compensated for the risk we're taking in the market. Right? Because that's the assumption. I mean, the assumption is we should be compensated for the risk we're taking. Now, there's a couple of concepts that are associated with this. This should look familiar. So the first thing you should look, look familiar to you here is this uh, beta. You should definitely know that beta is a measurement of a security's volatility as compared to the market. And we should be compensated for that volatility that we're willing to undertake, right? Now, if we have a risk tolerance that says we're willing to accept a high beta or a low beta, or understand that if we're not willing to accept that risk tolerance, that we're going to get a lower return, whatever the case may be. The risk for a re rate of return is this idea that we can make money without hazarding our capital, right? I mean, if I don't want to risk my capital in the market, I could buy T-bills, I could buy T-notes, I still have interest rate risk. But the point is, if I, you know, I was telling Austin, I have some real estate professional friends, and if they're taking about, thinking about making an investment in commercial real estate, they say, well, what is the required rate of return that we would find attractive to make this investment? You know, and basically we're going to compare that and say, well, that's not enough return for the risk that we're taking. And as I've said, the main things on math, particularly this type of math, whether it's this future value, present value, net present value, uh, the main thing is, do you understand inputs and outputs? You know, I'm wishing for Austin a dream draw. Everything he studied shows up. You know, maybe get a face of death draw and you actually have to uh, do this. So here, uh, let's go over the inputs. The input for the expected rate of return. Now, the way they say that on the test sometimes, Austin, is the required rate of return. You know, so we're looking at making this investment in this stock and we say, okay, what would we be happy with? P.S. We might not get that, but, you know, we should have at least some kind of a target, right? So risk-free plus market return minus risk-free. I think that's the thing most people get hung up on. The reason we're subtracting the risk-free rate of return from the market return is because remember, we could have got some of that return without having our capital. And I think you should recognize these formulas. By recognition, you should be able to pull that out of a lineup. Now on a bad draw, they might make you do some math. And the first thing I say is don't panic. So, you know, I usually, Austin say, uh, we'll do it tonight if you join us Tuesday. We're doing this on a Tuesday <laughs> tonight. And I usually in chat will say, how many people love math? How many hate math? And it's usually about 50-50. And statistically, people who love math and hate math are the best test takers. People who are apathetic about math statistically are not very good test takers. Right? So I guess that's good news or bad news. I'm, one of, I'm in the camp of, the way <laughs> of, you know, hey, somebody offers me a calculator, I say thank you very much. Right? So... The investor has a choice of investments, and that's what CAPM is about, making a choice that is informed, an informed choice based on what our expected or required return would be to make an investment in the market. So that's what this is all about. In this situation that I'm showing you, we can either invest in a risk-free investment, not take any risk, and get a return. You know, I've had clients when I was a practitioner, Austin Sedin, 
I'm already rich. Just don't make me poor and we'll get along fine. You know, that person's already where they're at financially. So the two things here we're comparing is a risk-free investment and CLC corporation. And this question tells us, and this is the main thing to recognize is inputs. The question tells us that the risk-free rate of return is 4%. That will be given information on your exam. And kind of a trick, it's whatever we assume. So be careful. Well, you know, I don't want to be sending out negative vibes, Austin, but you know, sometimes people say that's the T-bill. No, it's whatever the test uh, stipulates, or whatever we're going to use to right. do the math. So just be careful on that. But yeah, T-bills would be a, a, a adequate kind of a stand-in for that risk-free rate of return. So that's one mm -hmm. of our inputs. Beta, that is very testable. Very testable. So if we have a beta of 0 0.80, that means CLC is 80% as volatile as the market as a whole. That beta concept, you know, uh, Austin was asking me, well, where does this fit into the world? And basically, this is one of the underpinnings of, you know, analytical methods, modern portfolio theory, all that kind of stuff, right? And here, what we're saying is, what is your risk tolerance in terms of being in the market? So here, if we have a beta 0 0.80, 0 0.80 means 80%, 80% as volatile as the market. So the market goes up 10, we would have the expectation of eight. Market goes down 10, we'd have the expectation of eight. And again, that would mean that in an up, and this part is testable, in a upward uh, up market of 10%, we get eight. In a down market of 10%, we lose eight. And the point there on the test is that we're going to outperform in a down market, still down, but not as much. And we're going to underperform in an up market. Okay, what is the required return needed to be compensated for the risk of investing in CLC with a market return of 12? So as I've said, the main thing I want you to do or be able to do as a test taker is, you know, again, don't freak out, take a deep breath and say, okay, well, whatever math I'm going to be doing, it has to have these components to it. Those are our, our inputs, if you will, in terms of what the math we're going to be doing. So capital asset pricing, cap M. So now we're going to look at the math and say, okay, well, the risk-free rate of return is 4%. The market return is 12. Now, I did warn Austin that sometimes on your test, they might actually not give you the market return. They might make you kind of uh, work for it. And the way they make you work for it is by in introducing another stock and say ABC has a beta of one. And then this would say, you know, uh, ABC had a return of 12. And then you would say, oh, that's the market return. And then as I was uh, telling Austin, this is the main point. As uh, your, you know, tutor or coach, the biggest thing I would want you to be able to do is understand the input. In other words, what do we need to kind of answer this question? That's actually more important than actually being able to do the math. But if we plug in the formula, if we plug in the formula, that's what it looks like, right? What it looks like is 4% is the risk-free rate of return plus the market return. Market return is the S&P 500. That's always what we mean by market return. Minus four. Now we're taking the four out of the 12 because remember the 4% is what we could have got without risking our capital. Right. And so if we do that math, you know, we do parentheses first, we answer the question being 10.4. So uh, I could ask something like this based on that. We would be disappointed with a return of eight. Yeah, we would be excited about a return of 12 as con compared to 10.4. So that's what we would be expecting uh, to get based on this scenario. And so that's why we're doing the math. So, you know, I doubt I go backstage with a, a customer about cap M. <laughs> you know, say, hey, Austin, under Cap M, I'm hoping CLC <laughs> return to us 10.4, right? But right. Know, uh, we might later on have that discussion. Uh, but again, it's just a model. I, I joke about all this stuff, all the models and the theories and all that stuff isn't truth. It's just a way of explaining things. So I uh, hope that little uh, ditty about the Cap M uh, was helpful.